So the Game Changers documentary created a ton of controversy, but one great thing came out of it. It motivated a lot of people to eat more plants. Since the movie came out, a lot of you requested a video on how to introduce more plants into one's diet in a healthy way. So here we are. Now, let's not get bogged down in the food fights. This is not about vegan versus non-vegan. Maybe you want to go 100% plants. Maybe you just want to introduce more plants into your diet, but not completely eliminate animal products. We're not here to talk anybody out of making a positive change. We're here to make sure that whatever your specific goal, you reach it successfully and healthily. Is that a word? Yep. So we're going to cover the seven, the seven keys to eat more plants based on scientific studies, my own personal experience and feedback from the Nutrition Made Simple Facebook community. Teamwork, baby. We'll cover what to eat, how to transition, how to avoid deficiencies, everything you need to succeed. And we'll wrap up with a downloadable infographic summarizing everything for easy visual reference. This video is going to be a little longer than usual, but I wanted to make a one-stop shop with everything you need to get started and absolutely crush it in 2020. All right, I'm fired up. Let's do it. Step one, eat enough calories. As Rain wrote on the page, great name by the way, a big one for beginners is how to get enough food and calories without dieting too much. A dietary pattern where you're trying to eat more calories. How about that? Here's how it usually goes. People eat like this. Then they decide to cut back on meat, so they start eating like this. Then we hear all the stories. I felt weak, I was hungry all the time, I didn't get enough of nutrient XYZ. Yeah, no wonder. Have you experienced this before? So let's focus on the positive, what you want to eat more of, instead of focusing on what we want to avoid. It's more productive and it feels better at the end of the day. If you're going to cut back on meat, make sure to replace it with legumes, nuts, whole grains, etc. We'll come back to this in a minute with some more detail. And get ready to eat more, as in larger amounts. This trips a lot of people. I eat large plates of food and yet I never think about calories. That's because plants are generally less calorie dense, which means you can eat more food with less calories, especially if we're talking whole plants, which brings us to point number two. I complained about this in my Game Changers review. People often go from animal junk to plant junk. I get it. It's an easier shift. It's tempting but it's not what we're shooting for long term. The scientific evidence indicates that switching from animal foods to refined carbohydrates, that's processed food, doesn't improve our health. Now, if you eat plants for environmental or ethical reasons, great. But for health, we want to focus on whole unprocessed plants. Whole plants does not mean you have to eat all of it. It just means no artificial removing or adding ingredients. So plants as grown, not industrial concoctions. Okay. What about the Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger and all that? I'm actually making a whole video on those coming out very soon. For now, let's just say if you're eating those once in a while to scratch that itch, probably not a huge deal, but they're not the foundation of a healthy diet. There are way better options and delicious, which brings us to point number three, variety. Okay, let's get specific. The main groups are legumes, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, and let's not forget herbs and spices. And we could add mushrooms to that list too. Not plants technically, but great stuff. So you want to cover different groups, but you also want variety within group. Each vegetable has a different composition of antioxidants, phytonutrients, and different types of fiber, so they're complementary. Now, if you're like me, you may have a tendency to fall in a rut and just eat the same thing over and over. We're creatures of habit. So try a little challenge. I do this all the time. Next time you go shopping, buy a vegetable you've never had before. Let me know what you find. Okay, but what does this actually look like in real life, this eating a lot of plants thing? If you're just starting out, this may be a little confusing, maybe overwhelming, you're not quite sure what to do. No worries, simplicity is our middle name. Uh, more like the last name, but okay. Here's a visual. Take your plate. Imagine three sections. A legume here, could be lentils or beans, chickpeas, peas, tempeh, whatever. Pick your favorite. Start with that. Over here, a whole grain or starchy vegetable. Quinoa, corn, brown rice, couscous, sweet potatoes, all that good stuff. Notice how filling those are. We're definitely not talking side salads here. Third section is where your leafy greens go and all the other veggies. Red, purple, orange vegetables. Peppers, eggplant, okra, tomatoes, etc. Then the nuts, seeds, and spices sprinkled on. 
Powerful detail. We'll actually circle back to this in a minute. And fruit, people typically eat after or in between meals. Now, that's just an example to get you started. Obviously very flexible, but maybe that mental image with the three sections helps you in the beginning. Maybe things are still a little fuzzy. Maybe you need more examples to get your juices flowing. Here's a full day of eating. Morning, overnight oats with chia, fruit, and almonds. Lunch, black beans and edamame with spinach salad. I made that meal on camera in my Japan video, so check it out. And dinner, red lentil curry. Uh, yum. Does that help? I'll add more links with recipe ideas and resources in the description. There's more meal ideas on the web than you have time to cook or eat. Okay, little confession. You wanna know the truth? This is actually not that complicated. I remember when I started out, I would sweat the details. I wanted to know exactly how many milligrams of each thing I was supposed to eat and exactly what time I was supposed to have it and should I be facing Southwest. Are you the same way? If so, I get it. But the truth is, it's not in the details. The key here is the overall pattern. So if you're eating a lot of plants, mostly unprocessed and a variety of them, you're crushing it. Step four, one step at a time. We all like instant gratification. We want those results yesterday, in the morning. There's a 30-day weight loss, and if that's too long for you, there's a seven-day challenge. Still too long? Meet the seven-minute workout. The problem with that is, real change takes time. There's no point changing your diet overnight and giving up after like a month. There's no real benefit for you. Studies show most people who struggle to eat more plants give up in the short term. Once you go over that three-month mark, you're much more likely to stick with it. Some people can do the overnight transition and be successful, but most of us do better with a gradual steady change. It's not about what we eat today or this week or this month. We're building this for the long run, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, our whole lives. That's what this is all about right here. Okay, settle down, Tony Robbins. How do we do this steady transition thing? Glad you asked, one step at a time. Give your body time to get used to each change maybe a couple weeks, maybe even a couple months, however long it takes. Your gut needs to adapt to the different foods. Your microbiome needs to change. Have you experienced gut issues, gas, bloating when trying to eat more plants? That's often due to a sudden change. If your gut is used to 15 grams of fiber a day for years and you suddenly hit it with like 80, yeah, there's gonna be some blowback. A good rule of thumb is to have five grams every week. So if you're eating 15 grams of fiber a day, go to 20 grams a day, do that for a week, then 25, and so on. But even more important than your gut adapting to new foods is your mind adapting to new habits. And that's a gradual process. A lot of people start with one day a week, like the Meatless Mondays. Don't worry about moving forward really fast. Maybe one day a week is as far as you wanna go. Or maybe after a while you realize it's growing on you and you wanna add a second day, and so on. One step at a time. Does a whole day of plants seem like too much for you at first? That's okay, go slower. Start with one meal. Maybe change just breakfast. Do that for a while until it feels like second nature. Does a whole meal without meat seem overwhelming right now? That's okay. Go even slower. Don't remove the meat entirely, but center the meal around the plants. As Jim wrote, turn your plate inside out. Decide which legume you're going to have, then which whole grain. Then in the end, add some meat as a side dish. Focus on that next step in front of you, not the destination 50 miles down the road. Step five path of least resistance. It's really hard to stick with something long-term just through sheer willpower. Also, it's no fun. So it's really important to find foods we love and ideally that love us back. If you hate kale, trying to eat a big kale salad every day is probably not going to last. Maybe you hate raw vegetables. You don't have to eat them raw. If you don't like salads, try sauteing. If you don't like soups, eat your greens in a casserole. There's more than one path to success. The truth is your taste will change with time. And if you're a little further along and you've already experienced this, please share your experience below because I know that for people starting out, this seems a little unbelievable. Truth is steamed broccoli is like a snack for me now. It really is. And it wasn't always like that. One day I was steaming broccoli in batch for like a week and I noticed I was having a hard time holding back. I was eating it out of the steamer like it was candy. I was like, who are you? But that did take a while. So until your preferences change naturally, you gotta help yourself along. For a lot of people, it's not the meat itself they miss. It's the seasonings and the dressing and the flavorings. A great dressing can make a huge difference. I love adding tahini or hummus to salads, legumes, and grains. But if you want a fancier dressing, Derek Simnet has some great ideas for sauces that are healthy and not a lot of work. Also, spices and herbs. They're phenomenal for flavor and nutrition incredible antioxidant power. Pepper, turmeric, oregano, ginger, basil, cinnamon, chili, and of course, onion and garlic. 
And let's not forget vinegar. And some people say plants are bland. Another trick I love is adding fruit to salads. Grapes, oranges, apples, dates. Have you found some other tricks to add flavor to your food? Please share them below. I want to learn some new tricks too. Come on. Still on the topic of making things easier on yourself, another key technique is batch cooking. If you have to make each meal from scratch, that's a killer. Ain't nobody got time for that. I batch cook legumes and grains one pound at a time. I split them into Tupperwares and I freeze. So I always have food ready to go. I'm never stuck between starvation and delivery pizza. More preparation, less perspiration. Batch cooking is also great for to-go meals. I worked at UCLA for the last several years doing these long biological experiments, 14, 16 hour days. So I would come in with my backpack, four or five Tupperwares in there, and I was set for the whole day. I didn't need the cafeteria. I didn't need the vending machines. I was good. And I saved a boatload of cash. So it's important to set ourselves up for success. Step six, go easy on yourself. As Jessica wrote, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Do what you can until you can do what you want. Don't be too hard on yourself. I can't stress this one enough. I see people sweating the details or stressing out because they had a piece of cheese after six months on plants. Does that sound familiar? Stop trying to be perfect. That's only gonna hold you back. Let go of that pressure. I learned this one the hard way. Can you add one improvement over last week? If so, you're moving forward. You're in the 99th percentile for the overachievers out there. Just focus on one change you can implement that seems sustainable. If eating that hot dog on the 4th of July or the occasional restaurant meal helps you relax and feel normal and otherwise maintain consistency, then do it. It's not cheating if it's part of the plan, right? Just make sure it's not going to be a slippery slope. Some of us can't give an inch. And if that's you, you got to know yourself. But for the, for the majority of us, what really matters is that overall consistency. Robin wrote, we went vegetarian and then completely plant-based while not stressing out about the rare outing. Fantastic mindset. It's better to be at 80% or 50% for years than at 100% for a month. Like, way better. Also, do you have some people around you with common goals? That has a huge effect on your chances of success. Have you tried to make some of these lifestyle changes alone in a vacuum? Or even worse, with your family and friends doing the opposite and maybe giving you a hard time? Real hard, right? There are countless healthy eating communities popping up all over the world. So join one in person if you can, but even online groups can help a lot. Feel free to join our page or any other Facebook communities, meetups, etc. If you found a great one you like, please share the name and link below so other people can check it out. Step seven, doubt. Any change involves uncertainty. That's normal. The key is quality information. So keep reading good sources, keep informing yourself. I highly recommend not relying on just one source. No one holds the truth. It's not the Joe diet versus the Susan diet versus the Jack diet. Nobody owns the science or has any secret information that nobody else has any access to. It's not about finding that right guru that we can trust. Double check everybody, triangulate information. It's more work, but you'll learn a ton. Except for me, you can totally trust me, of course. Nope, fact check everything I say. Do me a favor and keep me on my toes. People challenge me in the comments all the time and that's how it should be. Now, when it comes to doubt, people worry mainly about three nutrients, protein, iron, and calcium. I've made videos about those in detail, but here's the gist. Both animal and plant foods have plenty of protein. All plants have protein, but it's concentrated in legumes, nuts, and seeds. There are nine essential amino acids, and all unprocessed foods, animal or plant, have all nine. If you eat a variety of unprocessed plants, you get all the essential amino acids that you need, provided your energy intake is adequate and you're not starving yourself of calories. There are some exceptions. For example, elderly people with very reduced appetite who have a hard time getting enough food and calories, or people with GI issues who can't tolerate legumes, for example. I touched on that in the Q&A video. In those cases, it may help to supplement with some animal products, at least until that underlying issue is resolved. But for the majority of us, Plants can get us all you need, and animal products are a choice, not a necessity. There are many studies that make this point. I covered several of those in my protein videos, and another one just came out last month from Stanford's Chris Gardner. The authors write, protein-rich foods like legumes, nuts, and seeds are sufficient to achieve full protein adequacy. The amino acids consumed by vegetarians and vegans are typically more than sufficient to meet and exceed requirements, provided a variety of foods is consumed and energy needs are met. The claim that certain plant foods are missing specific amino acids is demonstrably false. All plant foods contain all amino acids. The terms complete and incomplete are misleading. In developed countries, plant proteins are mixed, meaning people eat several types of plants, not just one. 
and total intake of protein tends to greatly exceed requirements, resulting in intakes of all 20 amino acids that are more than sufficient. They couldn't have made that any clearer. If we eat a variety of whole plants and we get enough calories, we get all the protein we need and all the amino acids we need, whether we choose to eat animal products or not. Okay, iron. I also made videos on it. There's a lot of iron in plants. The richest sources include legumes, leafy greens, and seeds like chia. And it's non-heme iron, which is associated with better health outcomes. The flip side is that the absorption is a little more variable. It can be inhibited by tea and coffee and boosted by vitamin C, onion, garlic, and beta carotene. So if you need more iron, you want to avoid tea and coffee during meals, and you want to favor foods like broccoli, red peppers, citrus, onion, garlic, carrots, and sweet potato. Okay, last but not least, calcium. This one is pretty straightforward because the best sources are leafy greens like kale and collard greens. They have as much or more calcium than milk, and it's more bioavailable as well. Another big doubt people have is supplements. B12 is the big one. It's a good idea to check your values at some point, regardless of diet. If your values are okay, you don't need to worry about B12, unless you're 100% plant-based. You can take 2,500 micrograms once a week, or you can get it from fortified foods if you prefer. Vitamin D your body produces from sunlight. But if your values are low, you can take 2,000 international units a day. And the last one is the long chain omega-3s, DHA, and EPA. If you don't eat fish, you can get them directly from seaweed, which is where the fish get them. Also, our body produces them from the shorter fatty acid, ALA, which you get from nuts and seeds like walnuts, chia, or flax. Some experts recommend the additional precaution of an algae-based supplement. I don't feel too strongly about it either way. This is one area where the evidence isn't crystal clear. There are a couple of trials pointing to some benefit of supplementation, although most research seems to indicate no benefit. But there don't seem to be any downsides of supplementing either, so if you want to play safe and take the supplement, I don't see an issue with it. So that's the gist of it. Let me know if you have any other questions I didn't cover. This infographic summarizes everything we covered in the video. You can download it at the link below. I hope that helps you get started and take that first step. New year, new life, right? So let's crush this in 2020. Happy holidays, everybody. If you thought that video was useful, consider sharing with others who might be interested and hit that like button and subscribe for more nutrition made simple. Also feel free to link up with me on Twitter for more in-depth nutrition science. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.